Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters, for the Sabbath the Lord has given unto us. It's uh, another great day that we join in together to learn of God, and I welcome you in the presentation, the parable of the time virgins. Shall we pray? Father, we want to know what you are speaking unto thy churches. And uh, I want to pray that as you speak to your church, our ears may be attentive to listen and to do thy perfect will and not submissive will. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is the gospel sound as rekindling reformation and this is the series the latter rain series we are in number 18 of the latter rain series and this is the parable of the 10 virgins the parable of the 10 virgins is found in the book of matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13 the parable that is so interesting and uh, like us to look at a few things that are contained in this parable because it behooves every Christian to understand what it means so as to know their position in this parable and so I won't waste uh, much time but uh, bring unto you the things that I have prepared and the things that the Lord shall speak unto me in this Sabbath as we look at this parable and wait for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the highlights of this parable it is often believed and taught the Ten Virgins parable with it is midnight cry messages all in the past and that it finished in 1844. Testimony of Jesus concerning this parable completely refutes this long-standing tradition. So let us establish the testimony of Jesus that the Ten Virgins parable is present truth for all Advent believers in right until the end of the probational time. In the book Review and Herald, book 2, page 419, and sometimes people wonder why we talk a lot about uh, where we pick on the spirit of prophecy so much. The reason, the personal reason why I wouldn't like to bring in my ideas, but what is inspired is that uh, people may hear what the Lord says, not what says the man. And that is why I love the spirit of prophecy so much, because if I pick the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, then uh, I believe I'm on the right track. I believe that the content that uh, they shall be delivered unto the children of God are pure contents and they are true. And so that is why I love uh, the spirit of prophecy so much. Thank you, Brother Paul uh, Ndove Makaveli. Thank you for your ministry and thank you for joining in with us. And uh, God bless you and your ministry. Uh, in the southern part of Africa. I know the Lord is using you guys there and uh, something good is coming uh, from there soon going around the four corners of the world. And so 
I was saying that the reason I love the spirit of prophecy so much is that it helps me to stay on the right course. Rather than just giving out my views of what I think, the spirit of prophecy limits me to what thus said the Lord and not what thus said the man. And this to me it is so much important than any other thing to know what thus said the Lord rather than what said the man. And so that is why I love the spirit of prophecy. Many people complain, why do you quote a lot from the spirit of prophecy? No, it is not because I don't know what the Bible says. I don't I know what the Bible says and I like just to confirm it with uh, what the Lord himself says what the Lord himself says without mingling in uh, uh, the prepositions of men and so uh, as I have said it is always believed that the ten virgins parable in the midnight cry is a past message of 1844 but let us examine if these things be so that the ten the parable of the ten virgins and the midnight cry ended in 1844. It was for the people in 1844 and it doesn't apply to our time. I'll go straight to the spirit of prophecy. This is the safest place to be. Let us read. When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends it is proclamation and it becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power or it will accomplish nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom are wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time, and like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of the time. Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, paragraph 3. And so we see very clearly that. Uh, the parable of the ten virgins has been and it will be it is some it's not something that was in the past and it will not be in the future but it was sounded at a time when the people were entering into the most holy place with the millerites and then it will be proclaimed even with a greater light and a, a, a proper understanding at the time of the angel of the uh, book of revelation chapter 18 and uh, We want to look at uh, what is the midnight cry of uh, uh, the, the people, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And uh, these are interesting things. I covered them in, uh, during the other presentation when I was speaking about um, the judgment of the living and the bloating out of sin. That is number 12 and number 13 in the presentation, the latter rain. But um, this midnight cry, if we have to be Bible students, we have to understand when is it sounded, and uh, I like to show you something. Tested by the image, this is in 7 BC 976, paragraph 2. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. I won't go into this a lot, but it is in the uh, presentation number 13 the judgment of the living. We are told that this is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a superior Sabbath will run under the ban of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of, of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. And so there is... You, you ask, how is the midnight cry for the Seventh Day Adventist happening at the time of the test of the image of the beast? The image of the beast is a test, is a midnight cry to Seventh Day Adventist. And then it actually swells into a loud cry where actually the Sunday law is being enacted. And the cry moves louder to the people who are of the world. And these things, I want them to come out clearly. If you have a question, pause. If you have anything that you have to say, say it so that we may learn together. And so, the Seventh Day Adventists have to be warned before the enacting of the Sunday law. That is their midnight cry. Because after that, the cry goes to the people who are in the world. And that one, you can see it in Testimonies, Volume 9 page 97 paragraph 2 where actually uh, one door is closed for the people who will not enter in while the hand is still 
and the door is still open for those who did not have the truth. And so the midnight cry for Seventh Day Adventist happens at the test of the image of the beast. And the test of the image of the beast is not the test of the Sunday law. The image of the beast is not the papacy, but the image of the beast is actually the apostate Protestantism. This I have repeated severally. That um, the image of the beast is actually the apostate Protestantism. Let me see if I, I, I can project it on the screen. The, the image of the beast, what is it? Uh, I should go to the book uh, Story of Redemption. The story of the redemption, that is uh, when you look at um, uh, chapter 4 of that chapter, Story of Redemption, chapter 54, which is dealing with uh, the third angel's message, the beast and it is image. I, I, I want just to show you what is uh, the image of the beast. It is different from the mark of the beast. And the people of God, let us backtrack a little bit. The people of God are tested by the image of the beast, not the mark of the beast. The Seventh Day Adventists are tested by the image of the beast and not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is Sunday sacredness and it tests, it tests the people of the world. But the image of the beast is the apostate protestantism and this is the test for seventh day adventists that should be clear as noonday that seventh day adventists are tested by the image of the beast and the people of the world are tested by the mark of the beast and so i, I want you to see this that um, when is the image of the beast and uh, i'll go to story of redemption page 381 by the first beast is represented Roman the, the, the Roman church speaking about Revelation chapter uh, chapter 13 verses 1 an ecclesiastical body clothed with civil power having authority to punish all dissenters the image to the beast represents another religious body clothed with similar powers so the formation of the this image is the work of the beast whose peaceful rise and mild professions render it so striking symbol of the United States and clearly the apostate Protestantism. Here is to be found an image of the papacy. When the churches of our land uniting upon such a points of faith as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institution. So the image of the beast, uh, this should be a clear quote to everyone, every Seventh Day Adventist, and it is their midnight cry because the mark of the beast is the midnight cry for the world. The image of the beast is the midnight cry for the Seventh Day Adventist. Now look here. When the churches of our land, that is United States, that is apostate Protestantism, uniting upon such a points of faith as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees. Not enforce Sunday sacredness, but enforce the decrees of the apostate Protestantism and sustain their institutions. Then will Protestant America have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy. Now, the real image of the Roman hierarchy is Sunday sacredness, which is her mark that she has authority. And the apostate Protestantism, the image to the beast, is their influence upon the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions. So we are not talking about Sunday sacredness here, but decrees to sustain the apostate Protestantism in view of coming to legislate the Sunday sacredness, which will be the mark of the beast. And the image of the beast is the one that gives life to the mark of the beast, gives back life to the beast which was once wounded, and then her wound was recovered, uh, was um, healed. And so uh, the, the very things we are seeing happening in the United States of America, these things that are happening are the image of the beast. As you see, apostate Protestantism enforcing things in USA, this is the image of the beast, and this is the test for Seventh Day Adventists. This is their midnight cry. After this, we shall see Sunday law enacted, 
and national apostasy will result into national ruin and then the warning the midnight cry now shall go to the world the sunday sacredness and so these are the things that we are looking in and they are the things that should be understood when we are speak, talking about the parable of the ten virgins and the midnight cry continued on in last day events page 179 paragraph 2 this is a common quote among the seventh day adventists the great issue so near at hand enforcement of sunday laws will weed out those whom god has not appointed and he will have a pure true sanctified ministry prepared for the latter rain and so if you are a seventh day adventist and you are waiting for the outpouring of the latter rain you are waiting uh for the latter rain to make you a true minister to the law to god brothers and sisters you are actually late when that time comes the preparation for seventh day adventists are now so that they may be able to sound the loud cry or the midnight cry for the world because the midnight cry goes until probational period ends as according to review and herald and so we have the midnight cry for seventh day adventist which is the image of the beast to the beast and then we have the midnight cry for the world which is the sunday sacredness or the mark of the beast and so the great issue so near the enacting of the sunday laws will weed out those who are not prepared those who have been tested by the image and they have faith they will be weeded out and those who are ready then they will be able to sound the midnight cry or the loud cry to the uh, world when the sunday law is enacted and so 1997.2 we are talking about the midnight cry and the parable of the ten virgins five wise and five foolish look at 90 what it says we are told that all that the people might know the time of their visitation there are many whom who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time there are many with whom the spirit of god is striving the time of god's destructive judgment is the time of mercy for those who had no opportunity to learn what is truth tenderly will the lord look upon them his heart of mercy is touched his hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who will not enter so you find that a door is closed on the other side and a door is open on the other side point three it says the mass of god is shown in his long forbearance he is holding back his judgments waiting for the messages of warning to be sounded to all oh if our people would feel as they should the responsibility resting upon them to give the last message of mercy to the world what a wonderful work would be done and so if it says that if our people would understand it means they don't understand and this is the lukewarmness that exists in laudition state and the lukewarmness that exists in the people of god who are saying that they are watchmen and sentinels on zion's work if they could be understanding what the Lord is telling them to do right now, they will understand that the image to the beast is actually our test. It is actually our midnight cry. And we should be doing something, preparing, so that we may be able to give the message to the world in a practical way, not in a theoretical way. By the way, the things that we shall establish will show the people that actually we have the faith of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Brother Zadok, for presenting this in the morning. That actually we must show the world that we have the faith of Jesus. And the faith of Jesus Christ is an experience exercised. It is a faith that is exercised. It is an experience that is holy in our lives and not a theoretical knowledge of the truth. And so we must be able to show the world that we believe what Christ has said in the testimonies. And looking at uh, a writing 254 and we are talking about the midnight cry and the parable of the ten virgins look at early writing page 254 but before i go there uh, i just want to ask to know what actually the lord is speaking to his churches and uh, i'll touch upon something that uh, I, I believe the lord is impressing on my heart we have lamented so much about the COVID-19 I know people have talked uh, different things about uh, this uh, trouble that is without right now but uh, I, I like us to realize that God has set it so 
and allowed things to happen as they are happening so that we may understand one thing we may get back to our bibles as reformers and seventh day adventists and be able to gather the truth that have been forgotten in this short period that covid 19 will exist the lord wants the seventh day adventists to gather the truth the pillars that they were given back then with the prophetess and then after gathering these fragments of truth the deal of the latter rain will fall upon them and then when COVID-19 comes to an end and the churches resume we shall have pure protestantism amongst those who have actually had a time with God during this COVID-19 and this break and this time that, that the churches are shut down they will be a people who have read their Bibles and have an experience with God that now will come out of this COVID-19 and go to the world to do a work that have never been done since the world began. And so COVID-19 is a preparation for the people of God. We may argue if it is a judgment from God or if it's a doing by men. Forget about that. Think about what the Lord is speaking to his people. There are people who have forgotten about their Bibles. There are people who have never looked in the Bible. There are people who just go to the church as a formality. Now the Lord has created or has allowed things to happen so that a people may have a time with their Bibles and those who will truly agonize with the Lord, the angels shall be sent unto them to open truth to them. And then when COVID-19 recedes, because I know the Lord is so great and merciful there are people who are right now stuck in town who should not be in town they have been actually following the lord with all their heart and trying every bit to get out of town now covid 19 comes they are shut in the town and what does the lord do it was an opportunity for them to sit down with their families and open up their bibles and ask themselves what is happening to this world right now and then they will be able now to make a decision to move out of these cities when COVID recedes and then go and proclaim the message with great power of what is coming in this world. In fact, this pandemic of COVID-19 is a miniature of what is coming before the world in a very short while. This is like uh, the time when uh, Cestius came to attack Jerusalem and then he went away for a short time and then Titus was able to come back and Jerusalem was raised to the ground. This is it, brothers and sisters, and this is what the Lord is speaking to the churches. When this COVID-19, and hear me today, when this COVID-19 comes to an end, if you have ever desired to leave the city, live right away. Go back to the country and make your life straight. Have a place so that you may be able not to be caught again in the city because after this, and after a short time of peace, there will come a pandemic more than COVID and those people who shall be still shut in town, I tell you, you'll never get an opportunity to get out of it. And according to Isaiah 13, those who will try to get out of it, they'll be killed by the sword. Their children shall be dashed down. The women who are pregnant, their wombs will be opened. This, this is not to scare anyone. I'm just talking about what the Bible says. And so, not out of fear, but out of love, the Lord has enabled things to happen the way they are happening so that we may have a time uh, to reflect upon His mercies and what is happening. And so, we are talking about the midnight cry and the parable of the ten virgins. Now, look at early writings, page 254, paragraph 1. As the ministration of, the Je of Jesus closed in the holy place, and He passed into the holiest and stood before the ark containing the law of God, He sent another mighty angel with a third message to the world. A parchment was placed in the angel's hand, and as he descended to the earth in power and majesty, he proclaimed a fearful warning with the most terrible threatening ever born to man. The message was designed to put the children of God upon their guard. By showing them the hour of temptation and anguish that was before them, said the angel, they will be brought into close compact with the beast and his image. And so the third angel's message, when it is just about to close, there are two things which are so clear presented 
in the last scenes of the earth history people will have to come in comfort with the beast and his image and then they'll have to wrestle with the mark of the beast those two things and so the image to the beast or the beast and his image happens before the mark of the beast their only hope of eternal life is to remain steadfast although their lives are at stake they must hold fast the truth then listen the third angel's message closes his message does here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of god and faith of jesus that is revelation chapter 14 verse 12 and then do you notice something as he repeated these words he pointed to the heavenly sanctuary now you know when you are reading the testimonies read it like you read the bible there was in revelation 10 the repeating of the message go and prophesy once again the third angel's message came to the people right there from 18, uh, 18, uh, 1846 downward to 1892. The third angel's message was proclaimed, people were sealed, and the Sabbath message was revealed to the people. But go and prophesy again because the message didn't accomplish what God had wanted to be accomplished. The children of God were not translated to heaven. Again, the message has to be repeated and at this point when it is repeated he pointed to the heavenly sanctuary the minds of all who embrace this message that is the third angel's message are directed into the most holy place where jesus stands before the ark you understand very well since 1844 the lord has been sitting according to daniel chapter 7 from verse 10 downwards the lord has been sitting I think it is a good time we go there. Let us go to the book of Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Going downwards. Daniel chapter 7 from verses uh, 9 to verses 13. It reads, let us read together. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And then it continues to say, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him thousand thousands, ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was said, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning fire. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought near before him. And uh, uh, when you go to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 3, verses 13, I want you to see, since 1844, the judge has been sitting. It says, The Lord standeth up to bleed, and the standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. So, at that time when the Lord stands up, he is stopping to plead and entering into another stage that is judging the people. When Stephen saw the Lord standing, it was the close of probation for the nation of Israel. When also the Lord stands, Daniel 12, verse 1, actually, Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1, when the Lord stands, what happens? And at that time, Michael shall stand up. We know this is the close of probation. So Michael has been sitting, but when he stands up, it is to judge the world. It is to protect his children. 
And so let us go back to this quote. It says, as he repeated these words, he pointed to the heavenly sanctuary. The minds of all who embrace the message are directed to the most holy place, where Jesus stands before the ark, making his final intercession. So Christ stands to make the final intercession for all those for whom must still lingers and for those who have ignorantly broken the law of God. This atonement is made for the righteous dead as well as the, for the righteous living. It includes all who died trusting in Christ, but who not having received the light upon God's commandment. So the final atonement is for the righteous dead and for the righteous living, but it includes those who have died not having light upon God's commandment and have sinned ignorantly in transgressing its precept. So the final atonement, which happens when the message of the third angel is repeated, and we know the third angel's message is repeated when actually the message, the angel of Revelation chapter 18 comes down, that is the uniting of the third and the second, and swells into loud cry. When the Sunday law goes, that is when the repetition of this third angel's message goes, because it has been there, but now it is repeated. And it is during this time that we have the final atonement, and this is the atonement during the mark of the beast. It is not the atonement for the children of Israel, the Seventh-day Adventists. It is an atonement for the children of the world, because the atonement of the Seventh-day Adventists happened 1844, to when the mark of the beast is pronounced. The final test for the Seventh day Adventist it is at the image to the beast, not the mark of the beast. And why am I speaking these things? We don't have to be actually foolish virgins. And so the prophet laments like this. My mind was carried to the future when the signal will be given. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. But some will have delayed to obtain the oil for replenishing their lamps. And too late, they will find that character which is represented by oil is not transferable. This is the time that the ten virgins are awake. Five wise streams their lamps and five foolish, they don't have oil. At the time of the test, during the test, the image of the beast, they did not obtain the character that can make them go through the time of the mark of the beast. Matthew 24, verses 45 to 47 and 48 to 51. The two types of servants produce the two types of virgins of the parable. That is, one, the faithful and wise servant. Sorry for that noise. The two types of servant produce the two types of virgins of the parable. That is, faithful and wise servant gives meat in due season. That is, he gives present truth, produces the wise virgins. And then we have the other one, which is the evil servant, believes in his heart that my Lord delayed his coming, produces the foolish virgins. He says, it is not a trifling matter for those who have the light of truth to be non-committal. So, what is wrong with everything? It is the non-committal attitude that many have taken, nor for the sentiments of the heart to be expressed in the words, my Lord delayeth in coming. The influence of the peace and safety sentiment is in the midst of us. A worldly malarious influence prevails to suit those who should be stirred by the message of truth to stand as faithful sentiments at the post of duty. Truth must be expressed in our lives. The light must shine brightly or we shall cause others to stumble and fall. Review and Herald, August 23, 1898, paragraph 4. And so those who are committed to the duty are going to reproduce a character that will befit the five wise virgins. Those who are not committal to the truth they are to receive, then they'll awake to be part of the foolish virgins. Those who hide their light will soon lose all power to let it shine. Because this is the time of the testing and we must let the light shine. They are represented by the foolish virgins. 
And when the crisis comes and the last call is made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. They will find that while they have mingled, been mingling with the world, their light has gone out. They did not continue to provide themselves with the oil of grace. The peace and safety cry hushed them to slumber and made them careless in regard to their light. And so, as Christ was with his disciples, when they are having their last discourse at Mount Olivet, Christ was looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom. He was looking in the future and he was able to tell them the parable of the ten virgin. And by their experience, illustrating the experience of the church that shall live before the second coming. This is the typical state of the church during the second coming. And so the two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for the Lord. They are called virgins. Why? Because they profess a pure faith. And so we are not speaking about anything else but uh, the whole Christendom that professes a pure faith. And the oil in their lamps, according to Psalms 119.105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my paths. And the work of the wise virgin is to rightly divide the word of truth, not being ashamed of anything. This is the oil that they may have in their lamp. And so, God is looking upon us at such a time as this. To see if we have studied his word and understood it so that we may be able to share with others because you will not share that which you do not have. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 250, paragraph 2. This is what we find. At the call, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The waiting ones arose and trimmed their lamps. They studied the word of God with an intensity of interest before unknown. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse those who had become discouraged and prepare them to receive the message. And this is what I said the Lord is doing right now. He is looking upon penitent confessors. And he's sending the angels so that they may trim, these people may trim their lamps. They are studying the word of God with an intensity and interest never known before. Brothers and sisters, if you are not doing that at this time when we are locked in our houses, if you are not taking your time to study the word of God and what it says, so that you may be able to practice, you are preparing to be a foolish virgin. And a foolish virgin will never give a midnight cry. No, the message will be proclaimed by something else. And so, looking at uh, 4SP 200 and 250 paragraph 2, angels are sent from heaven to arouse those who had become discouraged. But they are studying the scriptures with intensity and interest never known before. Then angels are sent. Because when you look at Revelation 18.1, it says that, and I saw another angel coming down from heaven and the earth was filled with the glory of God. So the angels are being sent to the people who are looking into these things and they are preparing them. Actually, they are anointing them for the work that is ahead. And then, as we read in Last Day Events 179, paragraph 2, the great issue so near, the enacting of the Sunday law will weed out those whom God had not ordained, and he'll have a pure, sanctified ministry ready for the latter rain. The angels are now doing the biddings of God right now, so that the people of God must be prepared. Let us read from Christ Object Lesson 408 to 411. In the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming, all have a knowledge of the scriptures. All have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearing. But as in the parable, so it is now. A time of waiting intervenes, faith is tried, and when the cry is heard, many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God, 
a knowledge of his word is of no avail. The theory of truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart unless the Spirit of God set the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish between distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. Oil is the heavenly grace of God. Review and Herald Book 4, page 110. The oil is the holy grace that is sent from heaven, and there must be an inward adorning with that grace if we will stand when he appears. And so, let us see what this grace teaches in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to, uh, to 12. The book of Titus 2, 11. What does this grace that we are being told teaches us in such a time as this? Titus. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and world lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and extort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. So, the grace of God have appeared to all men. This grace is given at the test of the image of the beast. And what it teaches it to deny ungodliness and live righteously. And so during the test, of the image. Now the grace is sent unto us that we may overcome so that when the mark of the beast goes, we are righteous and sinless so that we may be able to impart the same to the world. We might, we must have a practical knowledge during the test of the image. Then when the mark of the beast comes, we are ready. Now, I want to make a statement that I know every one of us will blush at us. Brothers and sisters, let us try to be practical right now. We are told that the image, is, the image to the beast is the test to the Seventh Day Adventist. Then the mark of the beast is the test for the world. At the image of the beast test, we must be what we shall be during the mark of the beast. I want to bring one aspect that uh, actually even I blush to st say the statement. That, that's why I'm stammering. The image of the beast is here with us. How many Seventh Day Adventists outside there are still buying and selling? So, can we say truly that we are passing the image to the beast? Can we say that really we can impart anything during the mark of the beast? Because during this image of the, to the beast test, there are things that must be in place that will make you go through the mark of the beast. And if we are not ready, at the test of the image to the beast, how can you be ready at the mark of the beast, which is not our test, but the test of the world? And so the things that those who are ready must have, uh, let me say this, there are some things that we must have at the test of the image that will help us show the world in, during the mark of the beast that this life leading it is possible. But if we have failed and we are failing during 
this test to the image of the beast. And I'll show you this. I have repeated this and uh, I, I'll show it in every presentation. I have to show it in every presentation. God willing. This is uh, 1MR 228.2. This is it. Look here. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare people to stand true to him during investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, and food factories. This is our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the course. And uh, so this is it. We are saying that uh, we have we have to be true to God during the investigative judgment. And if we are able, if we will be able to stand during the mark of the beast, then Seventh Day Adventists have to stand during the test of the image to the beast. But the things that make us stand during the tests, that is, the image to the beast, and the mark of the beast. There are things which are needed to make us stand during this time. And these are the things which are mentioned. Publishing houses, schools, sanitarium, hygienic restaurant, treatment, treatment rooms, and food factories. Those are the things that make us stand during investigative judgment. Brothers and sisters. Now, do you see us standing during the investigative judgment at the time of the image to the beast. And if we don't have this during our test, how can we stand during the mark of the beast? And no wonder Satan, by the way, looks at us because we are preparing to be foolish virgins, I tell you. We are preparing to fall during investigative Judgment and we are failing. 184.2 of PK. Let us see this. Thus the world will become mine. I'll be the ruler of the earth. The prince of the world. I'll so control the minds under my power that God's Sabbath shall be a special object of contempt. A sign. I'll make the observant of the seventh day a sign of disloyalty to the authorities of the earth. Human laws will be so made so stringent that men and women will not dare observe the seventh day Sabbath. For fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. The earth will be holy under my dominion. So, the test during the image of the beast is, are these people prepared? Can they live without buying and selling? Remember, we are talking about the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish, the midnight cry for Seventh Day Adventist and the world. This is our midnight cry, and it is sounding as you are hearing it, that we are failing during the investigative judgment, I being one of them, for now. I'm sorry, I blush to say this. But we are failing. We are preparing to be foolish virgins. We think that having a theoretical knowledge of truth will make us stand during the mark of the beast. No, it will be a practical implications of this truth. And so if we are to stand, and the other time, just last Friday is when we were being told that in other states, in other countries, the buying of the food is either on Saturday or on Sunday, during the Sabbath or Sunday. And so tell me, the devil brags that the Sabbath will be a sign of disloyalty to the authorities. And so if buying is restricted to Sundays and Sabbaths, and then here is 
the Roman hierarchy saying that now Sunday should be not used to do anything else but resting. No buying, no moving of vehicles and all those things. It means that now the buying is restricted to the Sabbath alone. And if we don't have these things, food factories, publishing houses, and all these hygienic restaurants, how can we survive during the taste to the image of the beast? I'm sorry. We are preparing to stand up. I'll tell you the story of Samson, which you know very well. Samson entered into a league with Delilah, this woman, who was a chief instrument from Satan to beset this man, the man of God. And uh, Solomon, um, Samson hid the, the secret behind his strength. And uh, at, at some point, Delilah started crying, you don't love me and all this, tell me where lies your strength because uh, Samson was lying to him, oh, the reason why I have strength is this and that. The point I want to make is this, there is a time that Samson gave in into Delilah and his head was shaven clean and he was a Nazarene. Now, Samson thought that he will just wake up one day again when he told Samson, the Philistine be upon you. And then he awake and beats all of them. No. Samson awoke that day when he was told that the Philistines be upon you, Samson. And he awoke, the hair was gone, and he thought he would be like the Samson of before, and there was nothing. The Philistine caught up with him. The Seventh-day Adventists have this habit of procrastinating and postponement of things, and they will wake up one day in the situation that Samson found himself in, thinking that there is still hair on his head, or thinking there is still time for buying and selling, and there will be no that time. And so, let us continue to postpone these things. We are told that the midnight cry for Seventh-day Adventists it is at the image to the beast. And so, we must run to the Lord. The coming of the bridegroom is at midnight, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of earth history. The great apostasy is going on. You hear stories even, some are authentic, some are not authentic, and you, you know what uh, the book of Matthew chapter 24, he says that you will hear rumors. Some stories are true, some stories are false. But these rumors should actually awake you even though there is no truth in them. But you hear a lot of things when you log on, on Facebook, on Google, wherever you can log in. You hear rumors of wars and wars actually. Many things happening that were predicted in Matthew 24. And so the world, it is in its darkest hour. And nothing is going to change. No. Will we have the character? Will we be practicing these things? The Lord is coming. Will we be weighed on the balances and found one, one day? Are our characters according to to what we have received upon the third angel's message. Will we awake and be like the foolish virgin? You read Revelation chapter 3 verse 3 and it says, If therefore thou shalt not watch, I'll come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I'll come upon thee. What hour is this? It is not the second coming because everyone shall see Christ in the clouds of the air. It is the hour of the closing of our probation. We are living in perilous times and actually the watchers have to awake. It may be an hour which we do not actually understand and we do not want, know that it shall be said that you have been weighed in the balances and found one day. And so, in the Laodicean state, we are told that uh, the state of the church represented by the foolish virgin is also spoken as Laodicean state. To be in Laodicean state is to be in the state of foolish virgins. 
No one wants to hear this. This is review and Harold August 19, 18, We hear that the church is in Laodicean state and the ship is going through. No ship is going through in Laodicean state. No foolish virgin is going through the door in, 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 in that state. Just as true as the foolish virgins are not going through the door, but the door when they came back was closed. So is the Laodicean state. No one is going through the door. Those who will be ready to meet their Lord must keep their lamps filled with the oil of grace. It was a neglect to do this that distinguished the foolish virgin from the wise. They had lamps, but not all their characters could not stand the test. Brothers and sisters, if anyone ever told you that the Laodicean church is the sheep of God and it's going through, it is the same as someone telling you that the foolish virgins are going through the door. Is that true of the parable really? Or should we read it and understand what the Lord is speaking to the churches? Let us read the book of Matthew 25. The book of Matthew. Really? Did they find the door still open? Verses 10. This is what we read of the foolish virgins. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also other virgins, saying, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Do you see that? Now, what does the prophet say? She says that the state of the church represented by the foolish virgin is also spoken of as the Laodicean state. So verily, as the foolish virgins will never go through the door, that is the truth of the matter that the Laodicean will never go through the, the door. There is no way the ship is going through. This is a false statement and whoever is entertaining it should repent of it. Each one individuality must do the work and determine through personal efforts to have the grace of God. I cannot form a character for you nor can you for me. It is a burden that rests upon every individual, young or old. The Lord is calling upon his people. And it is in crisis that the character is revealed. So now, the grand final test is upon us. The image to the beast. Before we go to the mark of the beast, will we be found ready? Or will we be found wanting? And so, as we speak about the foolish virgins and the wise virgins, there is another one, another thing that we should talk about. And I want to show you on the screen. Actually, I have to move faster now. There is a mysterious procession that is accompanying the bridegroom who give the midnight cry, which arouses all ten of the sleeping virgins. So the midnight cry is not given by the ten virgins per se, but it is given by a procession. Please note, the wise do not give the midnight cry. The best thing they can do is to join the mysterious procession, which goes in with the bridegroom into the festal hall, while the foolish virgins are left behind to try and buy the oil of the Holy Spirit when it is too late. At the call, the sleeping eyes are open and everyone is aroused. They see the procession they are to join moving on, bright with torches and glad with music. They hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The five wise virgin trim their lamps and go forth to meet the bridegroom. And so the midnight cry for the seventh day Adventist is done by the procession. And all they can do is to join in the procession and continue with the music through the mark of the beast to the world. The foolish virgins made no provision for their lambs and when aroused from their slumber, they found that the lights were going out. But while they went to buy, the procession moved on and left them behind. 
The bridal train entered the house and the door was shut. When the foolish virgin reached the ban banqueting hall, they received unexpected denial. They were left outside in the blackness of the night. Review and Herald October 31, 1899, paragraph 6. So the wise virgins who have been prepared joins the procession. And you ask, what is the procession actually? The mighty angel in Revelation chapter 18 comes down and then starts a procession. Oh, brothers and sisters, will we awake too late? While the foolish virgins awoke to find their lamps burning dimly or going out in the darkness, the wise virgins with their lamps burning brightly entered the festival hall and the gates were shut. Greatly rejoicing at the sound of the bridegroom's voice, they joined the bridal procession. So there are people in this world who are a procession giving the midnight cry for Seventh day Adventists, and the, the, the Lord is preparing the people who are in these fallen nominal Adventist churches so that they may make up the wise virgins and join the procession and then sound the loud cry. So either you are part of the procession giving the midnight cry to the Seventh day Adventist. Or the Lord is preparing you to be part of the five wise so that you may awake and give the loud cry. Which group has the presence of the bridegroom, Jesus with them, the sleeping ten virgins or the procession? Under the procession, of course, because the ten awakes and the five joins the procession, but the five foolish are lost. The testimony of Jesus has made it very clear that the wise virgins have to join this mysterious procession that is passing along with Christ on its way to the festival hall. It is this procession with Jesus who gives the midnight Christ to the ten sleeping virgins. And the state of the church in Laodicean state is also pronounced of the foolish virgins. Five foolish. And so the, this mysterious the mysterious procession is not part of the Laodicean church. It is a people in Philadelphian condition. I covered that yesterday in the pre presentation uh, uh, that I was speaking about what is Seventh Day Adventism. The true Seventh Day Adventism is the mysterious procession that gives the midnight cry to the Laodicean church. And the people who are prepared from Laodicean church comes out of this nominal Adventism and then joins the procession to give the midnight cry to the whole world. The little word join in connection with this mysterious procession is significant because in case that the wise virgins have to join something that they are not already part of. Just as the testimony of Jesus teaches us that we have to join the church triumphant, you don't join something if you are already part of it. Compassion beam from his, that is Christ's com Pilate, countenance and his conduct was characterized by grace, humility, truth, and love. Every member of his church militant must manifest the same qualities if he will join the church triumphant. And so for you to be able, the procession which the wise virgins have to join is described by the testimony of Jesus as being the company that walked in the light given to them. Review and Herald Book 4 page 109. So the company that is walking in the light that has been given to the Seventh Day Adventist since 1844 to 1892. This is the little company that is called the mysterious procession and when the five wise virgins awake they have to join this little company and then give the midnight cry or the loud cry to the world. But the five foolish virgins when they awoke and the mark of the beast is enforced they have to go and search for the oil and the oil is character and they cannot get character at that point and what are the things that have to reproduce character in somebody again we have seen in 1 mr uh, 228.2 the reason for the lord giving the third angel's message is to prepare a people to stand during investigative judgment this is why we establish publishing houses food uh, restaurants uh, uh, food factories, hygienic restaurants, and schools. So the little company are establishing publishing houses. They are having food factories. They are having their schools. And they are having their hygienic restaurants. These are the little company that are preparing to stand during investigative judgment when the judgment passes from the living, from the dead to the living. When the Sunday law is enacted, 
they have these facilities and now they can stand. And they, wise when they awake, joins them and they go to the world and they announce the second coming of Jesus Christ and they join the procession to the festival hall. These things should awake us wherever we are. Time is so finished, do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus Christ? Then I was pointed to those who are waiting for Jesus Christ and they will not get the mark of the beast. They must reflect the image of Jesus Christ fully. That is I'll write in page 71. I don't have time to put it on the screen. And so in order for us to be church triumphant, we must reflect the image of Jesus Christ fully. Look here. This procession which the wise virgins have to join is described by the testimony of Jesus as being the company that walked in the light given to them. So this little company that is walking in the light that the Lord has given to them during this test to the image of the beast are the ones that are going to make it and are the ones that are going to awake the virgins. You may think that uh, you will be part of the wise, but wake up when you are foolish. Jesus sends his people a message of warning to prepare them for his coming. To the prophet John was made known the closing work in the great plan of man's redemption. He beheld an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of judgment is come. And wash him that made the earth and the heaven, and the sea and the fountain of waters. 4SP 199, paragraph 3. The angel represented in prophecy as delivering this message symbolizes a class of faithful men. This is the little company walking in the light given to them. It says, who obedient to the promptings of God's spirit and the teachings of his word proclaim these warnings to the inhabitants of the earth. This message was to be committed to the religious, was, this message was not to be committed to the religious leaders of the people. They had failed to preserve their connection with God and had refused the light from heaven. Therefore, they were not of the number described by the Apostle Paul, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. The little company with the light. These are the children of the light. A simple summary must be helpful to bring out the historical pro precedent concerning the procession who gives the midnight cry to the sleeping virgins. One, as we close, many of those who cherished the light of the first angel's message broke the cords which confined them and stood out separate from those companies. That is, they separated from their churches who were opposing the first angel's message. Two, the ministers and leading men of these churches who had themselves rejected the light of the first angel message were tightening the cords of control over their remaining members and they were constantly saying God is with us, we stand in the light, we have the truth. But they, there was a first disappointment for those who had cherished the light of the first angel message which caused discouragement. The second angel's message is then sounded and the message of the midnight cry accompanies this second message. Those who had cherished the light which had been imparted to them, united with the angels to hell, gave the midnight cry. Those who give this message are persecuted by those who have rejected the light, and a voice is heard telling them to come out from among them and touch not the unclean. A large number broke the cords which bound them, and they obeyed the voice and left those who were in darkness, and united with those who had previously broken the cords, and they joyfully united their voices with them. So, the little kamban that has light breaks the cords from the churches, from their religious groups and walk in the light, and then at the repetition of these messages, those who had been held by their religious leaders break the cords once again and join this procession. 8. The honest in heart still in the churches which had rejected the light from heaven reach out their hands to help the united company who are free rejoicing in God, and the only answer given to them is come out from among them and be separate. And the individuals who are honest in heart after struggle finally break the cords that had bound them and they join the free company. Who composes the procession? 
it is those who had previously broken the codes that is those who had previously or earlier on in point of time left their churches for rejecting the light sent to them from heaven this is the historical precedent that can be learned from the study of Adventist history this procession is in our time as far as it relates to the ten virgins parable must therefore be those who have previously separated themselves from the backslidden Laodicean church before they give the midnight cry to the ten sleeping virgins this the best the wise virgins can do is to join this procession that is giving the midnight cry to them by going out of the sleeping Laodicean church has God no living church he has a church but it is the church Milton not the church triumphant we are sorry that there are defective members that there are tears amid the wheat although there are evils existing in the church and will be until the end of the world the church in this last day is to be the light of the world that is polluted and demoralized by sin the Lord is calling us to come out of lukewarmness out of Laodiceanism and out of this nominal Adventism that we are seeing these days. The Lord has to call these people out. And those who still remain in nominal state will be destroyed. God is calling out those people who are listening. That they may come out and be part of the procession. Duties, we have the duties to do. We have a truth. And I, I, I want to read you this. Because you say, is there a message to call people out of the church of God? There is no there is no message from God to call people out of his church. There is a call from nominal Adventism, Laodicean state, and foolish virgins. Look here. I saw that God has honest children among the nominal Adventists and the fallen churches. And before the plagues shall be poured out, ministers and people will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. Satan knows this and before the loud cry of the third angels is given, he raises an excitement in these religious bodies that those who have rejected the truth may think that God is with them. People think that the sheep of Laodicea is going through but no, God is not with them. He hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for the churches. But the light will shine and all who are honest will leave the fallen churches, that is nominal Adventists and fallen churches, and take their stand with the remnant. That is the procession. The wise virgins will come from this nominal Adventist and fallen churches and they will join the procession and go to the bridal hall. While the other people the foolish virgins will not go through. Brothers, in closing, what are we saying? We have been chosen as a people to herald the second coming of Jesus Christ. 90, page 19. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. This is the time to show the world what is the true Seventh Adventists are. God is calling us out of this nominal Christianity. And the Lord is faithful. He who has called us into marvelous light, He will give us the strength to be able to stand true to Him during investigative judgment. What shall we do? It is to implicitly, actually, surrender ourselves to Him. I'll read the last thing as we close. That is, steps to Christ. 
and I pray that this may not be our condition. Let us read in closing Steps to Christ, page 47, as we close. Steps to Christ, 47, paragraph 2. It says, Desire for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if you stop here, they will avail nothing. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to the point of yielding the will of God. They do not now choose to be Christians. The Lord is calling us to choose to be Christians today. The Lord is calling us to choose to be Christians today. My prayer at this moment is uh, that uh, the Lord may work in our lives. The Lord may shine upon us that uh, we may not be found on the side of the foolish virgins. Either let us allow the Lord to use us as a procession, the little company walking the truth, or peradventure if we are asleep. Let us awake as five wise virgins before it is too late and join the procession so that we may be able to overcome during the time of the test to the image. So that during the time of the mark of the beast, we may be able to show the world what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And in order to do that, I'll not want you to forget 1MR228.2. God's purpose, I'll read this in closing, sorry, 1MR228.2, I'll repeat this quote until we have it off head, in closing, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitarium, hygienic restaurant, treatment rooms, and food factories. This is our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the course. In the course of what? In the course of the third angel's message and standing true to God during investigative judgment. I can surely tell you this not as a prophet but a student of the word of god if we are not going to have publishing houses schools our own schools leave those babylonian schools we repeat if we are going not to have sanitarium and hygienic restaurants treatment rooms and food factories it doesn't matter how good you are in anything you are preparing to fall during investigative judgment and this is what we are doing. May the Lord save us from this state and make us to do the right thing before time is late. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is true and it doesn't lie. The one who is coming according to Habakkuk 2 will come, but he will not be pleased with those who backslide. Father, help us to do the work of 1 MR 228, the third angel's message for the seventh day Adventist Isaiah chapter 58. Give us what we need to stand during this investigative judgment. And although finances may be difficult, Lord, we know that you own silver and gold. Give unto thy people that they may be able to establish this uh, institutions before it is late when there is no buying and selling. Thank you for thy grace and thank you for answering our prayers. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May the Lord be with you and establish you in present truth, not only theoretically, but practically. Shalom.